Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, to this Dean's Lecture. And as everybody knows, this is a time when we, uh, when we take some time to reflect uh, on the accomplishments of our colleagues and, and, um, and, and sort of mark this really important part, this stage of their professional life. And, you know, I think uh, we were talking beforehand that uh, all of us are always on this treadmill of grants and, uh, you know, papers, and, and uh, we often don't have time to sort of take joy in, in, in what we accomplish. And so that's part of what we're here for uh, today. And, and, and as I often say, that I'm cynical about many things in life, but not cynical about being promoted to professor here. Because it's really difficult to, to get on the faculty, and, then, and it's difficult then to succeed. And, and the decision people will often ask me, you know, what's it take to get promoted to professor? And I, and I say, you know, you know, uh, to make you decide to promote me. And I always say it's not my decision. It's not really the AMP committee's decision. It really depends on the input and the letters we get from people all around the world. And so, so this is really, uh, this, this stage is really an affirmation of your accomplishments and everything that, that, that a faculty member, and especially parole, has accomplished. And Perul has been on, the, when I looked at her CV, uh, she's been on the Chris Byer track, right? She, she has been um, in every track. She, she was a faculty member when we, when we were trying to figure out how to recognize all the different kinds of faculty we have. So she's had, I think, been on four different tracks here. And, uh, and, uh, and she's really made, and I met, I remember, I don't know if you remember when we first met, was um, after I became dean, I was going around meeting with departments. You presented the first year and presented the trial you know, about uh, you know, iron and, and um, in, in pregnant women. So, so uh, and I had the, the great pleasure of when I was in Bangladesh with the Health Advisory Board, and Al was there, and a number of people in the room, and we got to see uh, parole in the field and, uh, and see uh, the, the maturity and the judgment and the experience she brings to her work. And I, I, I brought with me um, a copy of this magazine, which some of you know, have seen, you know, this is our school magazine. And, and this, this article, this issue had an article about the work in Bangladesh and Javita. And, uh, and there's this wonderful picture of Perul, uh, you know, in the field. And what I liked about this article, and I always read the, uh, as Al before me did, I read the, the, uh, the magazine in TypeScript. And, you know, we, they try to <laughs> pretend that we give input to the articles. But, we, but, but I remember reading that article, and, uh, and uh, it was about how Perul trains the data collectors. And it was such a, a you know, when, you, when you're an epidemiologist, you care so much about data, about the validity of, you know, sampling and collection and, and of reporting. And she said it so well. She said, you know, when I train these people, I tell them that these data are people's lives, you know, that they represent what these people go through and experience. And so that's why it's important to be true to the data. It's a really great uh, description of, of uh, and I thought uh, a, uh, a statement of your commitment to quality and to the importance of your work in the communities that you work in. So, so you've done a lot. I'm, I'm not going to say uh, say much more, but y you know I think everybody knows probably Perul better than I do. But she's worked for 15 years in the uh, in nutrition, especially micronutrient deficiencies, and how the these deficiencies and and supplementing uh, to try to counteract the deficiencies influence uh, maternal, infant, and child health. Uh, in, in the developing world, especially in South Asia. She's worked in Nepal, she's worked with, she's in the human nutrition program, but has worked cl you know, widely across the department with people from GDEC, with Jim Tilch and Joanne Katz and, and others. And she's uh, worked in uh, Pakistan where she did trials of severe anemia in pregnant women and young uh, children. She works now in Bangladesh and is co-PI of a trial, which is a very large trial to look at the efficacy of maternal multiple micronutrient supplementation in improving infant uh, survival. She's been recognized in the school and outside the school for her, her, her collegiality and for her, her leadership and her academic accomplishments. And uh, originally from India, she has uh, an MS uh, from the University of Baroda in India, and then came here and got her uh, MPH and DRPH from the Bloomberg School, and then eventually joined the department so uh, in international health. So, so Perol, you're, you're the kind of faculty member when I see what you do and I know what you do in the field, it makes, uh, makes me feel good about being dean of this school. So, so you're going to come up and talk to us about your work, and we're looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that must be the present for the new professors, right? <laughs> 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 
Thank you very much for those kind words, um, Mike. And I know that you just come back from India <laughs> a f few hours ago, so I really appreciate you being here. <laughs> and if you don't, if you go to sleep, I'm, I'm not going to, um, uh, you know, feel badly about it. But thank you all for coming, and it is my privilege to be presenting to you today. And I thought uh, what I would do is uh, recount to you a story. Uh, of it, about 10 years of work that we've done in following uh, a pregnancy and a birth cohort, um, our experiences and lessons learned from uh, that work in rural Nepal. The title of my talk is Micronutrients in Early Life, Setting Trajectories for Health and Development. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit uh, about the title itself. What, what do I mean by early life? And uh, of course, it all begins in the womb and the first thousand days of life, um, starting from pregnancy through two years of age, um, is that critical window uh, uh, of time that we are talking about. I'm not sure if you've heard about the Thousand Days Initiative or partnership, but um, that partnership really emphasizes this period in life. And um, I've just put a quote there on, uh, from their website saying that, this period is a unique uh, window of opportunity to shape healthier and more prosperous futures. Also, for those of you who don't um, live and breathe this word micronutrients every day, I thought I would tell you a little bit um, about how the WHO uh, talks about it. Micronutrients are called those uh, micronutrients because they are needed only in small, minuscule amounts. Uh, but these substances are like magic wands because they enable the body to produce enzymes and hormones and proteins and other substances essential for proper growth and development. As tiny as the amounts are, uh, the consequences of their absence um, uh, is, is severe, uh, are severe. And iodine, vitamin A, iron, and zinc and others are some of the more important global health, uh, public health problems. Their lack represents a major threat to the health and development of populations in the world, especially in young children and pregnant women in low-income countries. And conceptually, sort of, um, the way I thought about this um, talk was, um, is depicted here in this picture where uh, early life nutrition and nutrition in utero has immediate effects, short-term effects largely uh, on central nervous system and brain development, um, the system that is um, most spared in, in, in terms of our growth and development. Growth and muscle mass and body composition um, are also uh, important and they are influenced by early nutrition. And then me metabolic programming of um, lipids and glucose and carbohydrates and um, protein hormone receptors genes, all of these um, short-term uh, manifestations occur with exposure to uh, nutrition in, in the early critical window of time. Each of these um, um, have a long-term consequence, and so cognitive development and function, immune function and work capacity, and um, uh, risk of chronic disease later on in life is influenced by these short-term changes that are produced by early uh, nutrition. And so quickly, the outline of my talk uh, is as follows. I'm going to talk a little bit about fetal growth restriction, its causes and consequences, the role of maternal micronutrient deficiencies, and uh, tell you a little bit about um, the, the study that we did looking at the effects of prenatal micronutrient supplementation on birth-related outcomes uh, from a study we did in Nepal, but also some other studies, and then talk about the long-term consequences of this supplementation intervention on um, outcomes of survival, growth, and cardiometabolic function. And then finally talk about um, prenatal and postnatal zinc um, supplementation and how it can influence cognitive uh, uh, development in school age. So in, in terms of some background, um, birth weight is um, one of the birth out, uh, outcomes or pregnancy outcomes you're very interested in. It is a measure of intrauterine growth and gestational age. And birth weight is one of the leading factors uh, that influences subsequent health and survival in many uh, low-income countries where 19 million 
um, or 95% of low birth weight babies are born. Um, the prevalence of low birth weight is high in many of these countries. It ranges from about 15 to 30 percent or even higher in some settings. And the subcontinent actually bears the highest burden of low birth weight in the world, followed by Africa and then um, Latin America. Fetal growth restriction is harder to assess. We generally tend to um, measure it at the time of birth uh, with this indicator called small for gestational age. Uh, usually um, you, you would not have ultrasound weight, um, techniques to assess fetal growth restriction over the course of, uh, of gestation, but what you do is you look at the weight of a baby and, and relative uh, to a reference standard of uh, fetal growth, you look at whether they are below the fifth percentile for a given gestational age to define small for gestational age. And the consequences of fetal growth restriction, of course, are multiple. Uh, there's increased mortality and morbidity, uh, impaired immune function, poor postnatal growth in childhood, um, as well as poor neurocognitive development and function, and then in later life, uh, increased risk of hypertension, diabetes, and coronary heart disease. Maternal nutrition, of course, is um, critical in influencing some of these birth outcomes. And these are data from a WHO collaborative study um, using data from um, over 100,000 women showing that pre-pregnancy um, maternal nutritional status indicators of height, weight, and body mass index, index are related with some of these outcomes. And so the odds ratios that are presented are uh, for each outcome um, per unit decrease in each of the maternal indicators. And so uh, you can see that for low birth weight and SGA, the odds of those adverse conditions um, is doubled uh, with every unit de decrement in height, weight, or BMI. We know that nutritional status is not as influential in uh, determining the risk of preterm, so the odds ratios for preterm are a um, little lower. Let's talk a little bit about micronutrient deficiencies. Almost 2 billion individuals globally are estimated to have one or more micronutrient deficiencies, and there are multiple causes for this, uh, including chronic poor quality diets in many settings, cultural factors that influence um, the diet of women and children, uh, low bioavailability, especially of certain nutrients like vitamin A and iron and zinc uh, that are derived from plant sources, Illness and infection have a huge role to play in terms of the utilization and absorption of nutrients. And then even now in many settings, seasonal variation is huge in, in, in terms of food availability. And of course, requirements during certain periods of life are higher. The focus is largely, uh, with re regard to micro micronutrient deficiencies, has largely been on pregnant women and in young children. And deficiencies during pregnancy are associated uh, with increased risk of adverse birth outcomes and in young children with poor growth and development. So in terms of micronutrient supplementation strategies, um, in the developed world, of course, it's a common practice for women to take a one-a-day prenatal supplement. Uh, but the evidence for its benefits, especially in well-nourished populations, vis-a-vis uh, -vis these birth outcomes is not very clear, um, and whether these, this approach would uh, work or not needs to be tested in, in the more impoverished settings where deficiencies are common. And so with that preamble, I'm going to tell you about our study that we did in Nepal. Our study site is located um, in the southeastern part of Nepal. Uh, we are southeast of the Kathmandu Valley, about six, seven hours drive. And the green um, area on the right there um, is um, the, the, the study area that I'm going to be talking about. It is located in the Sarlahi district of Nepal and adjacent to uh, the B, uh, um, Indian state of Bihar. It's about uh, 300 square kilometers in, in area, and, and uh, there are 150,000 people who reside in that area of Nepal. It's flat, it's agrarian, it's largely impoverished an area. And there are two types of l l major ethnicities that reside here. People who have migrated from the hill areas of Nepal um, 
and then the migrants from uh, India who are the two major ethnicities and culturally and in economic uh, ways these two ethnicities are quite distinct. And um, our project uh, that was started there uh, was called the Nepal Nutrition Intervention Project Sarlahi or NIPS. It was started by Keith West and Al Somer and Joanne Katz and others in uh, the late 80s and um, we've done a series of trials there uh, starting with NIPS 1 and we may now have reached NIPS 7 or 8, I've lost count now. <laughs> uh, but um, this is a, the building, um, this is our project um, office in the field and one of the things that Keith taught me early on is that logos for projects are very important and so you might recognize the, the art NIPS logo which has the Hopkins dome and the eyes of the Bodhanath uh, on top of it and we even tried to create that structure on top of the, the office building. Um, what I'm going to tell you though about, uh, is about the third of the trials that we did there from 1999 to 2001 and in this trial we wanted to test the efficacy of um, two or more combinations of prenatal micronutrient supplements and birth outcomes. It was a standard design double mass controlled cluster randomized trial and our study area had been divided into 426 communities or clusters and each one was randomized to one of five supplement arms. Uh, over one year we recruited about 5,000 pregnant women and supplemented them through pregnancy until three months postpartum and our primary outcome of interest was birth weight with some other secondary outcomes. Bear with me as I take you through this um, slide and tell you about the five supplement groups. In a previous uh, trial, NIPS2, we had shown that uh, weekly vitamin A supplementation could significantly reduce pregnancy related mortality and uh, vitamin A had no impact on birth weight and so we thought it ethical and, and prudent to use vitamin A as the control group in this uh, NIPS 3 trial and so vitamin A alone was the control group and then iron and folic acid are, are commonly recommended for uh, antenatal use. We've never been quite clear why folic acid has been added to the iron and so we wanted to s uh, see the differential effects of the two nutrients and so they were added at the recommended amounts. Um, and then I talked with Bob and I said, Bob, should we test zinc separately? Should we have a separate arm for zinc? And of course, um, he said yes and we decided to have that as the fourth arm. And then the fifth arm was a multiple micronutrient supplement, had all of the three nutrients uh, plus 11 other um, micronutrients uh, in the mix, all at in the single RDA for pregnant women. Uh, this was a community where antenatal care was quite limited and most of the babies were born at home and so we uh, had to recruit um, local women. We hired 426 of them who conducted the work of supplementing women in the communities and married women were first uh, enumerated and they were visited um, once every five weeks to ascertain menstruation histories and then they were tested with a urine test to uh, look for pregnancy. In doing this, we were able to enroll women early on in gestation because we wanted to start them on supplementation early on. And, um, and so uh, we did that. And one of the things we noted was, of course, that there was a high burden of um, multiple micronutrient deficiencies that existed in this population. We did assessments of serum concentrations of these various nutrients uh, across 10 different uh, nutrients and, and showed that 80% um, of the women had at least two or more deficiencies and uh, many have a high percentage also had three or more uh, deficiencies. So they were entering a pregnancy with these deficiencies. They were also uh, very malnourished using traditional anthropometric measurements of weight, height, and BMI and mid-upper arm circumference using these cutoffs that are commonly used to look at um, underweight and wasting and stunting in women. There was a high prevalence of uh, those in, in, the, in this trial population. Also, we had to set up a birth notification system 
an assessment uh, because babies were being born at home and we wanted to get their birth weights. And so again, our 426 workers were very important in making this happen. They notified us in time to, um, to get at birth. Now, uh, the study started in um, 1999 and we're just rolling along, doing well. We, are, we had um, gotten out the pediatric Sega sales scales to do the birth weight measurements. And then we had a little bit of a pause in all of this action that was going on in the field. And the pause was related to Al's pals visiting Nipsland. It was um, a wonderful three days of the health advisory board who came to visit um, our NIPS site and we had a great time taking them around to show them um, babies being born at home. And of course the Princess um, of Thailand, Princess Serene Torn, joined the group and that was a, an exciting event as well. But just going back to the results um, of the study, and these have been published a while back, but um, in terms of the mean um, birth weight that we found in this population was pretty low at 2.6 kilograms, and 43% of the babies were low birth weight. Um, folic acid on its own had no impact on birth weight, so all of the rest of the numbers below here are relative reductions in each of those outcomes. Um, so folic acid had no impact on birth weight. Folic acid and iron uh, improved uh, birth weight and reduced the risk of low birth weight by about 16%. Interestingly, adding zinc removed that effect of um, iron on um, birth weight. And then the multiple micronutrient supplement, which, which had iron and zinc uh, with 11 other micronutrients, um, increased birth weight the most uh, with a similar reduction of 14% in um, low birth weight prevalence. We were um, not powered to show small differences in mortality. Um, given that our sample size was only 5,000, but we did see some evidence of a lowered mortality in each of the three groups um, um, with folic acid, uh, with iron, or with zinc, although not the, the, these reductions were not statistically significant. But perplexingly, the multiple micronutrient supplement, which produced the biggest um, birth weight effect uh, had a relative risk of 1.19 and that th this was something that we couldn't uh, um, get a handle on, especially if we started comparing the 19% increase in the multiple micronutrient in NMR relative to the iron and folic acid group, which is the standard of care. There was, our p-values were starting to get um, significant. Um, we also observed that um, in the multiple micronutrient arm, unlike in the iron and folic acid group, uh, there was an increase in the risk of large babies. And um, the cutoff that we used was, was about 3.4 kilograms. But um, one of the things, well, in this smaller uh, size population, that cutoff is, um, is what was reasonable because uh, macrosomia was virtually non-existent in this population. And, uh, but we weren't quite able to um, uh, see that qualitative difference uh, between the iron and folic acid group and the multiple micronutrient group. And so we took our data to um, um, Scott Zeger and Francesca Dominici in the biostats department at that time. And we uh, asked them to help us with analyzing this data. And they used a novel technique called the square method to look at whether there was this, any difference between the type of treatment effect that iron and folic acid produced versus the multiple micronutrient. And basically, I need to use the pointer, but I've been told not to. So the, these dotted points are, um, uh, of course, the actual data points. And then the dark line here is the smooth spline function of the treatment uh, effect expressed across the quantiles of the birth weight distribution. So you're not just seeing a mean effect, you're seeing uh, where in the distribution of birth weight uh, is the um, treatment effect. And the same thing is shown here for the multiple micronutrient supplement. 
And so we saw this qualitative difference between what iron supplementation was doing versus the multiple micronutrient supplement. Iron seemed to improve birth weight uh, by about 80 grams uh, in the uh, birth weight group less than 2,800 grams, whereas the multiple micronutrient improved birth weight across the entire birth weight distribution. So it pushed the upper tail of the birth weight distribution to the right. Um, uh, Joanne Katz worked, of course, on the substantive paper, and Francesca wrote a couple of methods paper um, in, in biostatistics journals. At that time, also, um, Gary Darmstadt had just arrived as the neonatal health expert in our group, in our department, and uh, we shared this data with him, and he, he sort of um, hypothesized that if these babies are uh, getting bigger and if their moms are so malnourished and short, perhaps uh, that may have caused a, a, s a situation of fetal distress and birth asphyxia in this population in that particular um, uh, arm of the study. And so we, because we had done verbal autopsies um, in, in, these, um, in the deaths that we encountered in the study, uh, we were able to look at um, birth asphy asphyxia specific mortality rate. And there was some evidence of an increase in, in um, a cost specific mortality, the, the relative risk in the multiple micronutrient supplement uh, relative to the um, relative risk in the iron and folic acid. We also had collected birth asphyxia morbidity from um, the birth assessment that we had conducted and using a WHO algorithm um, for defining birth asphyxia, we uh, showed a 60% increased risk in birth asphyxia in the multiple micronutrient arm. And also related to complications um, in delivery at the time of delivery and labor, again, these are self-reported data, but we found women who had um, uh, who were in the multiple micronutrient group reported uh, longer duration of labor as well as uh, babies being stuck at the time of labor. In the meantime, uh, UNICEF and WHO had also initiated um, this activity of trying to develop a prenatal supplement for use for pregnant women in low and middle income countries. And so they called a consultative group and they developed a formulation which they call the UNIMAP formulation, which just stands for UN Maternal Micronutrient Preparation. And uh, basically it, it was very similar to the kind of preparation that we had uh, tested in Nepal. And uh, nine trials were commissioned by them in different parts of um, the world. Uh, three other trials had also been done around that time, including ours in Nepal, which tested a similar formulation. And so we were all gathered in uh, Geneva uh, at WHO to organize this meta-analysis of all these 12 trials which had used a prenatal multiple micronutrient supplement. Most of those trials had actually only tested iron and folic acid versus the, the full complement of nutrients, unlike ours, which had five arms. Uh, these are the data from the meta-analyses. Uh, as you can see, there was a lot of um, heterogeneity in the birth weights in these populations. So there were studies from Asia, several studies from Asia, uh, some from Africa and Central um, South America, but uh, uh, birth weights in, in China and Indonesia were much higher. Um, and of course, in Africa, they were also not as, as low. But the, the countries that experienced the most, the smaller, had the smallest babies was, of course, uh, the South Asian countries and, uh, of Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. And then here are the results of that meta-analysis from 12 trials uh, comparing multiple micronutrients versus iron and folic acid. Um, there was a very modest effect on birth weight, which was significant, of 22 grams. Um, in, in the pooled analysis. Low birth weight was reduced by 11% as well, uh, and 10% reduction was seen in small for gestational age. Uh, there's no impact on preterm delivery. And large for gestational age um, was also looked at, and there's a 13% um, increase in, in that 
And then with mortality, uh, there was no impact on mortality, but the relative risks were similar to what we had seen in, in Nepal. Um, and this, this may be the last trial that we um, actually do of multiple micronutrients versus iron and folic acid. Um, we started this trial to definitively look at an impact on infant mortality in, in Bangladesh. And um, so the control group is iron and folic acid. And this was the trial that um, uh, Mike Clegg, you were referring to, um, the large trial with 25,000 babies. We have finished enrollment in the trial and are finishing up now follow-ups that will continue through July of this year, and we hope to get the results from this study. Um, again, it, with this uh, trial, uh, two years after we had started, we had a little bit of a pause in, in our study as well, because this time it was Dean Clagg who brought his um, uh, friends from the um, Health Advisory Board. And Habib, which is, which is similar to Habibi, um, just means um, Health Advisory Board in Bangladesh. And so <laughs> uh, we had a wonderful time with them. The princess of, uh, from Thailand came along again as well for the ride 10 years later, uh, and, and it, was a, it was a great visit. I just want to, um, though, end with this idea, um, this concept of constraint that has uh, that is quite well described in the fetal gr growth literature, and this, um, and especially using animal studies, um, you, the uterine volume and um, the uh, factors that influence um, growth, especially towards the end of gestation, are. Uh, very much driven by maternal size. And so fetal growth um, is, um, and birth size are very strongly correlated with maternal stature. And constraint is important because of, um, uh, of the risk of dystocia. You don't really want fetal overgrowth because that may put uh, both the fetus and the mother at a, um, at a risk. And if you have uh, both of them dying, then that would lead to an evolutionary failure. And so that is um, something just to keep in mind. Eating down or eating less during pregnancy is, is actually practiced in many cultures. Um, and norms for birth size are generally smaller than what you would uh, expect in other settings where babies are born much bigger. And so one should um, pause and think about why we find such modest effects of interventions uh, that, have be, that are aimed at enhancing um, bird size and, and field growth. Um, the, the increments that I mentioned to you were really in a very, very uh, modest range from 20 grams to 60 grams or so. And then we have uh, well recognized this intergenerational cycle of growth failure, that small babies uh, end up having um, uh, poor growth during childhood and in their adolescent years, and if um, and they grow uh, and, and then they end up being small adult women. Uh, early pregnancy may actually exacerbate this, and and this again then uh, results in a small adult woman giving rise to low birth weight babies. And these are some neat data looking at how has women's and men's height. Uh, um, changed over time in, in these are data from 54 different countries um, uh, stratified by whether um, the women belonged to uh, poor uh, families so the lowest um, I have to show this here the lowest line here the couple of lines are is the growth in height or change in height I should say uh, among the poor um, quantiles compared to um, height uh, in the richest group, uh, showing that there has not been any change in the height of adult women uh, in, these, um, in these populations over the past four or so decade. I'm going to switch gears and talk now about the long-term consequences and um, the developmental origins of health and diseases this area of research in which there has been a lot of focus 
on looking at early life exposures, especially looking at associations between size at birth and the risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes in adulthood. And this research has largely been done in birth cohorts in developed countries. But we know and uh, very well now that both the burden of fetal growth restriction and non-communicable diseases is, is the highest in developing countries. And many of these con con countries are going through rapid nutrition transition. And this is where there's a real need for doing more research in this area of DOHA. We also know little on, about the role of micronutrient deficiencies in DOHAD, and uh, there have been very few, this is one of the biggest criticisms of the DOHAD work, that there have been few long-term follow-ups of intervention studies that have been done uh, during the critical period of win uh, pregnancy and early childhood. And so I'm going to tell you about the follow-up that we did of the NIPS-3 cohort that I just described to you in 2006 and 2008. And in this study, we um, tracked the offspring of the pregnant women uh, who had participated in the NIPS-3 trial. Uh, they were now six to eight years of age, and we had fairly high follow-up rates of 75 to 80% in this um, cross-sectional study that we did. And the long-term outcomes of interest um, for us were survival, growth in body composition, and early biomarkers of cardiometabolic risk. Um, all the assessments were done at home, and we, um, beyond looking at just general uh, socioeconomic status characteristics, dietary intake data, um, collecting dietary intake data or morbidity data, we did um, uh, anthropometric measurements in these children, including um, measurements of tricep and subscapular skin folds, waist circumference was taken, and we did a lot of blood pressures for the children and the moms across the study area. Um, and there's also some biospecimen collection that was done. We uh, attempted and were quite successful actually in getting fasting blood and urine from the children, and we also collected cheek swabs for um, future genetic work. Um, and all, some of the data were, some of the biospecimens were processed in the laboratory itself in, in Nepal. And so we measured lipid profiles, we looked at glucose and insulin levels in blood, HbA1c as a uh, marker of um, hyperglycemia, and we also looked at albumin creatinine ratio in urine. So just to tell you about uh, the outcomes or the results of this follow-up, the survival of uh, children whose mothers had received the five different treatment groups seemed quite um, dis distinct. And um, the top line here is the uh, there's a survival probability of the uh, iron and zinc group, and the blue line here is the um, the control group, and. Um, when we calculated the hazards ratios, um, and this is looking at child years of follow-up and number of deaths and um, mortality rate from the time of birth through seven years of age, uh, we were able to see about a 31% reduction in a zero to seven year mortality associated with iron and folic acid supplementation uh, in pregnancy. The relationship um, between birth size and blood pressure was as um, we expected. Across all these birth measures uh, t um, that we had, weight, length, pondral index, uh, and gestational age, there was a negative correlation of those with both systolic and diastolic bl blood pressure at six to eight years of age. Their current um, anthropometric measures were positively associated with um, systolic blood pressure, which is what you would expect um, as well. But when we looked at blood pressure um, and insulin resistance using the uh, homeostasis model uh, assessment method or HbA1c, we found no difference by treatment group. So there did, did not seem to be any uh, difference in blood pressure or insulin resistance uh, by the type of supplement that they had received in pregnancy. There were some modest effects that were seen in some groups, and I'm just going to 
um, tell you about the results, uh, but please interpret these with a little bit of caution because these are younger children and they're still, um, they still haven't reached an age where uh, these cardiometabolic risk is really high. But we did see um, a reduction in uh, urinary microalbumin creatinine ratio of greater than 30. There are only 4.5% kids who had that in, in the control group and that was reduced with the prenatal folic acid supplement. Uh, and the risk of metabolic syndrome was reduced by about 30% or so, uh, 35%. Um, it also, again, in the folic acid group. And uh, MS was uh, defined using uh, the, these criteria. Three out of uh, any of these five conditions was considered as metabolic syndrome. And then there were modest effects with prenatal zinc uh, uh, supplementation. In the prenatal, uh, in the arm which had the zinc, there was an improvement in height of about um, 0.6 centimeters uh, and a reduction in stunting of about 20%. And uh, there's a little evidence of reduced uh, peripheral adiposity as um, measured by the tricep skin fold and the subscapular skin fold. Uh, variables and a measurement of um, fat area of the arm. Uh, these uh, effects were modest and we don't really know how clinically meaningful they are, but um, it, mo many of these um, tend to track over time and so future follow-ups may perhaps be important to, um, to, to look at whether there were long-term effects or not. So just to uh, summarize some of what I told you, uh, antenatal iron and folic acid reduced um, zero to seven year mortality by 30%. We don't really know what the mechanism may be for this, but it may be that improvements in fetal growth uh, may continue to have functional benefits beyond infancy and that there could be an unmeasured enhancement in, immune, in the immune system uh, as well as programming effects. In, in this population, there was yet no evidence of overnutrition or, or overweight. And so uh, these are young children and they're still quite malnourished. So any reduction in early biomarkers of uh, cardiometabolic risk would need future evaluations at older ages. And then I'm going to quickly tell you about the story um, on cognitive function. And iron and zinc are the two nutrients that have been um, linked to uh, cognitive development. Uh, there's um, a, a vast amount of literature on uh, the um, importance of iron in infancy and iron deficiency in infancy has been associated with cognitive and motor impairments later in life um, that are uh, irreversible. But randomized controlled trials of prophylactic iron supplementation to either infants or children have not found conclusive evidence of a benefit. And um, there's virtually no evidence of the effects of gestational iron deficiency on childhood development. Zinc is also important for central nervous system development and trials in children have actually shown increased activity and motor development, uh, but limited, there's been limited impact on cognition. And so um, in NIPS we had um, some of these nutrients uh, that we gave to um, pregnant women. And soon after the NIPS-3 trial was completed, um, Jim Till, Jim Joanne Katz um, uh, started a new trial on the heels of the, the NIPS-3 trial, which was a uh, two by two factorial study of iron and folic acid and zinc supplementation to young children. Uh, so, Many of the NIPS-3 babies were actually enrolled in the NIPS-4 trial, and so we saw this as a unique opportunity to look at um, prenatal and postnatal iron and folic acid and zinc supplementation on neurocognitive um, outcomes. And so we did a battery of tests, um, including uh, a test for general in intelligence, which is called the UNIT, we did the standard motor assessment battery for children um, and fine motor control was assessed using finger tapping uh, tests and then executive functioning um, which measured um, inhibitory control and speed 
uh, processing speed was um, assessed using these three tasks. And of course, because um, uh, child cognition and, and function are influenced by so many environmental factors and, and household and schooling factors, we, we, had, uh, we collected a plethora of data on all of the other factors and confounders that um, we thought would be linked to cognitive function and development. Uh, these children were brought into a central site and we had um, masters in psychology trained um, uh, testers who administered these tests to these kids over a course of uh, three to four hours. And uh, I just wanted to share the results of, the, of, this, of this investigation. The um, columns to pay attention to are just marked here in red. Again, it was the iron and folic acid supplement, um, the prenatal iron and folic acid supplement, which had the strongest effect ac across the whole battery of um, um, tests that we had done, and scores on those tests were higher in that group relative to the control group. We did a multivariate regression analysis for this um, data because many of these uh, tests and outcomes or scores on these tests tend to be correlated and, and we showed a, a global p-value that was highly significant and then for each of these tests um, we also showed a significant improvement in uh, test scores. Uh, these uh, results were not seen in the iron and folic acid zinc group or the multiple micronutrient supplement group. And then with regard to child supplementation, we, um, uh, because it was a two by two factorial study, we approached the analysis um, uh, in an appropriate way to, in the absence of an, an interaction, we looked at the iron folic acid effect versus, uh, by comparing it with, with no iron and folic acid and zinc was compared to the groups that had received no zinc. And again, ne neither of these two interventions had any impact on any of the cognitive um, or motor um, uh, functions that we tested in these children. And so I want to just um, wrap up by talking a little bit about future research directions. I think in all of this uh, work, um, preconceptional nutrition is still a neglected area. And uh, when women start a pregnancy, um, if they're malnourished, it sets off a fetal growth trajectory that is quite different from women who are not. And so supplementation, not just during pregnancy, but between uh, uh, pregnancies, both food supplementation and uh, micronutrient supplementation may be important. We don't know much about nutrition education or counseling in pregnancy, and there's much work that is required for doing that in low-income countries in settings where women don't have adequate antenatal care. Uh, the adolescent growth period is an important period during which to intervene and try and promote catch-up growth uh, to address this issue of maternal short stature, and the same thing goes for growth in the first two years of life. And then, of course, uh, I couldn't say um, more about the value of uh, following these pregnancy and birth cohorts to examine long-term outcomes and growth and health and developmental trajectories. Uh, these cohorts are just valuable, and the more we follow them up, the more we will learn regarding the impact of early um, exposure, early life exposures and long-term outcomes. Our funding... Um, we had a diverse portfolio on that. <laughs> um, USAID funded the NIPS-3 trial and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation also supported it. The cognition study was funded by NIH and we got some small amounts of support from UNICEF and our supplements were um, made by Roche and Neutralite and Jameson in Canada. And these are all the collaborators and co-investigators on these studies. Um, you know, when you're doing this work for so long, there we have people who are no longer there. Um, and, um, and Penn State, uh, John Beard is the nutrition and um, um, iron neurobiology expert, was a, a great collaborator that we had who passed away. 
and Lisa Prathan and Shadaram Shrestha uh, in our team. Um, I also wanted to thank our NIP staff. We had, you know, a large staff there who made all of this happen. And um, um, this is one of our annual meetings where all the 426 local female workers, and then you see some men scattered <laughs> in, in the midst there uh, come together um, for, to make speeches and get together. And then I, if you bear with me, I just wanted to um, acknowledge a few people who have contributed immensely to my professional career and growth and development here and have been great uh, mentors and collaborators. And first and foremost, Keith West, who um, um, was, has been a wonderful mentor and has st supported, in me, supported me so well right from the time when I was a student here. And he's doing what he loves best here, which is eating dal bhat in, in the morning <laughs> in Nepal. Um, uh, Joanne Katz and Jim Tilch have also been great mentors and close colleagues, and I've worked with them in Nepal for a long time. I really um, admire Rolf Clem and Ellen Labrique, who are my close colleagues, and we've also been working for the past dozen years in, in Bangladesh together. Al Somer has tracked my career also from my school age, and uh, he's always uh, challenged me to think innovatively and has been just very inspirational. He loves to pour over data. So I remember the time when he was a, the dean, he would sit down with me and look over tables and, and figures and try and both be scratching our heads trying to figure out what the data was all about anyway. And Bob Black, our esteemed department chair, has, has been wonderfully supportive and has uh, guided me throughout my um, career here as well. Uh, a few other colleagues, Steve Leclerc and Suburna Katri and Luke Maleni uh, from Nepal, we, we work closely together. Laura Caulfield has been a good advisor as well and has taught me all about how to coordinate an, the academic program in nutrition. And then we have a very energetic and a very um, um, exciting group. We call ourselves the Micronutrient Research Group, and Carrie Schulze leads the, uh, she's the director of our Micronutrient Lab and a, a great um, nutrition scientist. Li Wu has supported both faculty and students with, with statistics for a very, very long time, and, and she's a wonderful colleague as well. Andre Hackman and Moithali Mitra and Ellen Massey lead all of the data management and programming aspects of our trials across studies. And uh, Sucheta Mera keeps us all on track, basically. And, uh, and Rhonda Skinner is um, a, a wonderful um, uh, administrative person who helps everyone beyond Keith West, who she's primarily supposed to support, and then Shami Mamba and Sajidin Sheikh, and a lot of others from Bangladesh are, have been great colleagues. And then finally, um, our research wouldn't advance, and we wouldn't learn, and we wouldn't grow professionally without all of the students who, who work with us. And so these are a great group of students. Some of them are now doing great work in other institutions, and um, I'm really proud to have um, been um, their advisor and, and, and interacted with them. I've learned a lot from them, and um, I, I keep in touch with, with all of them. Uh, and finally, these are my parents, and um, they're really very uh, proud, and uh, they've been very supportive uh, throughout the entire time that I've pursued um, this career. <laughs> and they're in Texas right now. They wanted to escape the cold, so they decided to be there, and uh, they regret not being here. But thank you very much. Thank you. I found when I started, you know, I was working in clinical trials, or, and I could never get the people who I was working with who were doing clinical trials to care about using the uh, cohort, you know, doing observational analysis. So it's great to see it use the data. So, so questions or comments? Yes. 
please. And, oh, could you use the microphone? So because uh, this is being recorded, let me give you this mic here. Yeah. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed the talk. I have a very uh, basic question. I don't know if it's silly. But I was just wondering, the standards that you use for the birth weights, are they uh, by location or by socioeconomic status? Or is it the same birth weight in Nepal as in US, the standard birth weight? So birth weight is just measured with a, a pediatric scale. And we just use the cutoff that is used universally, which is 2,500 grams. So everyone less than 2,500 grams was considered low birth weight. If you're talking about the small for gestational age, the, the growth uh, references that we have are um, mostly from uh, developed countries and they're American field growth reference standards. I know there's an uh, initiative, uh, that there's a study that is being funded by the Gates Foundation, which is trying to develop a inter international fetal gro growth reference. Um, um, and so we are awaiting that. So, so maybe I can follow up on that. Yes. Uh, because cause this is an issue in the US, right, where, where African American children are, are lower birth weight. And the debate that, and I haven't followed the debate, always was, is that, is that reflect uh, uh, ethnic differences in birth weight you know is it you know how much of that is due to the fact that some some populations really do if you give them the same nutrition have a lower birth weight versus it, it reflects intrauterine and you know maternal exposures right it's a sort of a corollary of your question so I think that um, there are um, people who think that using um, maternal characteristics specific references may be more appropriate because the shorter mothers are going to have smaller babies and so there are adjustments that you can make for maternal size in general uh, but um, the, the, the genetic differences are not likely to be huge uh, for, for at least fetal growth and so there are some these elegant studies done in animals where you can take like a Shetland pony embryo and, and implant it into a Shire horse and that baby and that pony will grow large. Huh. Um, and so it's, it's really this whole idea that I was trying to convey about the, the uterine, uterine uh, environment yes. and, and size and volume and blood flow that, that seems to matter, at least in the later part of gestation when, um, when the growth of the fetus is rapid. Any other comments or questions? No? Uh, in the back there, let me give you uh, Oh yeah, so Josh will bring the mic up. And could, could you bring up the lights, please, in the room? Thank you. Hi, Dr. Christian. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, my name is Preeti from SBI. I'm a PhD student. And my question is um, related to one of your future research directions that you talked about um, the need for nutrition education and counseling mm -hmm. in pregnancy. So my first question is really to what extent is there nutrition education and counseling among pregnant women? Because certainly, you know, as part of these interventions, I would understand that there is some education and some sort of exchange of information about nutrition or micronutrition. So, so where do you see that? Then as a second part of the question is where do you see that in the future? So in, in the US, for example, uh, every uh, antenatal care visit would end up in um, a counseling session uh, where you, you would even uh, perhaps um, have uh, food records or, or dietary um, intake information on the woman. You would have information about her weight gain over a certain period of time. And then around that, you could do individualized counseling um, as well as look at things like hemoglobin and blood pressure. Uh, here, there's more of a concern of gestational diabetes and hypertension in pregnancy, so there could be counseling around that. Um, we've looked at the literature uh, related to 
just general counseling in the context of these other these settings that we are talking about. And there's virtually no contact with the healthcare system. Uh, and, and we don't really have good messages that we can provide uh, to pregnant women and, and certainly not anything at the individual level because you need some information from them to be able to do that. And so it would be really good to work more in that area. If you look at the literature, you don't see many um, BCC types of interventions that have been tested in pregnant women, which is a huge gap, I think. Um, Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you've ever looked at the actual shape of the distribution of birth weights in the population and um, to see whether they look like the distribution of birth weights in Western populations. And when you get an effect from the interventions, does it change the whole shape? Does it shift the distribution? Does it, does it affect the tails? What, what, where does the effect take place? Yeah. So uh, the uh, population, the birth weight distribution is fairly normal, just like you would expect um, to see. Um, the data that I was showing you with the, the fancy biostatistics methods that was, that was trying to show you exactly that, that with the iron and folic acid, it was the left tail of the distribution that was pushed in, whereas with the multiple micronutrient, it was the entire distribution that had shifted to the right. So you were seeing a, an effect across the distribution in one group, but not in the iron and folic acid group. And we don't, I, I have no idea why that is, why that would be. Uh, but the B-complex vitamins, which are very important in energy metabolism, they may be doing something different than uh, iron folic acid with its role in uh, improving hematologic um, status of, of women, et cetera. So, that's that's all I I can tell you. So maybe I can. Add, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just just to show how old I've gotten, but um, it's been uh, terrific to watch somebody as gifted and as committed as you are begin as a student and then give their professorial lecture here. So I want to congratulate you, Perul. You've really been a terrific colleague, even as you were a student, and you taught us a lot along the way, and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from you in the future. Thank you. I think we should end on that. And, uh, okay. and if you keep talking, she's going to start crying, I think. So, okay. so, uh, so thank you, Perul. So thank please join much. us for a reception outside.